actually a full course we are trying to do in one session. So, obviously, we will not be able to do full justice to it as if uh, every detail of this is going to be covered, but uh, uh, I think a couple of uh, uh, qualitative factors about hardware description languages are very important to understand before we go. Uh, and also then I will take out a little bit of the practical part which will be useful to you in doing the experiments. So, essentially much of this session will be understanding below the bonnet kind of details of a hardware description language what is really involved and a little bit about the actual description of hardware ok. So, let us first begin with why are hardware description languages required. And the real reason for hardware description languages is that electronic circuits have become extremely complicated. Now, the way we learn electronics is through drawing circuit diagrams ok, but if you have circuits which use a Pentium for example, uses uh, about 10 to the power 8 transistors ok, 100 million transistors. So, there is no way that you can draw a circuit diagram using 100 million uh, transistors. Indeed to understand such complicated circuits, the only way to go about is to have a hierarchical understanding. That means, let us take a simpler example, let us not talk about Pentium every time. Suppose we take an 8085 with which everyone is familiar, even to describe an 8085 is a big deal as a circuit diagram. So, we never draw it to a transistor level. In general what we do is we draw it to a block level. So, if we say here is the register file, here is the bus interface output you know bus input output unit, here is the interface unit, here is the ALU, here is the instruction decoder and so on and then show the interconnection of those. Once we have understood this interconnection, then we open out the ALU and say ok here is the adder subtractor, here is the shifter, here is the AND unit etcetera, etcetera. So, inherently this is uh, understood hierarchically, you understand a bigger circuit as an interconnection of block diagrams and then you open out each block diagram and depending on the complexity, you may describe that block also as an interconnection of other blocks till you have got it down to devices which are readily available ok. Now, so therefore, this involves essentially two journeys up and down the complexity path. Uh, it involves for example, this uh, design as well as synthesis. So, therefore, description and synthesis are two opposite ends of this journey. In case of simulation for example, you describe the circuit and then ask what is its behavior. In synthesis, you describe the behavior in a standard way and ask which circuit will have this kind of behavior ok. And both of these must be made easy and this is what the hardware description languages do all right. Before I get into very deep details of hardware description and so on, you are all electronics teachers. So, I would like to ask you what is electronic design, what do we understand from electronic design. all of you have taught, taught electronic design, design based things and so on. So, what is electronic design? Component values, of Component values of what? So, is that the only thing that just the values of resistor is the design activity? Power supply, but that is not all there is to design, you are looking at you know different parts of an elephant here. So, particular operation I, so by the way none of these things is wrong. These are different ways of looking at electronic design in different ways, but one way of putting it is that you where do we begin, where do we begin electronic design with specifications right. Somebody gives us specifications, so we are given a set of specifications.
Okay. By the way, I am doing it on purpose on the board. Again, there is a proper lecture series on this uh, content which will be made available. But I uh, again do not like this flashing an entire page of information at you at one go. I would like to evolve it step by step. Okay. So, we begin with specifications right? and then what is our what is our final goal from specifications where are we supposed to go? We have to come up with the final design right. So, therefore, what is actually specifications? The specifications is a statement of the behavior of a circuit. What is the behavioral description? It says that when you do this, this should happen. Okay? So, if this signal goes to 1 or there is an edge on this signal, then this should happen etcetera, etcetera. A description which involves describing the behavior of a system that is specifications. Right? And when we have finished our job, what have we got? Let us say some specification was given to you and you have designed it properly. So, no, no. So, what do you return to the guy who asked you to design? Specifications are met, but what is your output to that guy? What are you giving? To, that guy gave you specifications. What are you giving to him? Give me a list of things that you will give, give back to that person. No, no, hardware is too wide. You will give him a circuit diagram, a list of components, the value of these components, right? So, what we return is essentially an inter, so, so then design uh, our circuit which will finally result from this is an interconnect connection of known components. Right? This is our final output. What was given to us was the description of the behavior of a circuit. We have based on our experience, I know how a D flip flop behaves, I know how a counter behaves, I know how an adder behaves and if I connect them in a particular way, then I believe that the behavior of this will be the same as the behavior. Right? The act of conversion from here to here is electronic design. You agree with me? Right? The idea is that we are given some specification which is essentially a uh, uh, essentially a description of the behavior of some system. The guy who is giving me the specification will does not even know components. He does not know what is a bipolar, what is CMOS, whatever. He knows behavior. This is what I want. Right? It is our job then to select components and to interconnect them in a particular way using our experience. That is our art. Right? And using our art, we interconnect these in a particular way and finally give, give back to him saying connect this component to this kind of component this way and the component should have this value. Right? So, what you said about the value is important, but that is our output back to that person. Okay? So, the value of the component is only one of the list of things that I will return. This is in other words a structural description. Right? We are given behavior that give me a circuit which will have this behavior and what I return to that guy is a structure saying here is this component, here is this component, pin 3 should go to pin 9 of that etcetera, etcetera. So, this description if you look at it is the description of a structure, what is connected to what. Whereas, this is a description of behavior, what happens when. Right? And the act of electronic design is conversion of this to this. Right? Now, nobody is saying that given some complicated behavior, you will up and produce a circuit which will have this behavior. That is not practical. Right? So, actually what, what happens is that in this journey as we go from behavior to structure, there are various steps in between which are partially behavior partially structured. Okay? So, for example, suppose you told me design an 8085. Now, 
designing an 885, it may be a simple circuit by today's standards, but it is a big deal. I cannot sit in an afternoon and design an 885 and give it to you, right. So, what do I do when an 885 is to be designed? I just break it up into blocks, right. So, what I say is that suppose I had a register file which was connected to an ALU in this fashion. Of course, I am not showing the detailed way of connecting, but I will have some idea that if it is connected to an ALU and the ALU receives instructions from an instruction decoder and the decoder got the instruction from the bus interface and so on, right. Then my 885 will work. This is my first stage of decomposition, right. At this stage of decomposition, what have I done? I do not know right now how this ALU is going to work, right. I do not know what is the detailed design of this ALU at this stage, but I know that I, if given a description of the ALU, I can design it. I trust in myself, right. So, I, I say that okay, ALUs can be designed, register files can be designed, decoders can be de et, et cetera, et cetera, right. At this stage, I am partially structural because I have described this interconnect, okay, that there will be an internal bus and there will be an enable signal and three clocks later and there will be a state, whatever, right. So, that I have designed. However, I have not designed the innards of this. However, I have derived the specifications of this. I know exactly what this ALU is supposed to do. For example, in case of an 885, I know that I should be able to add and subtract, but I do not require a multiply and divide, okay. So, now what have I done? I have described this structure, but I have also derived a behavioral description for each one of these, right. In the next step, I will take just this behavioral description and build it up, okay. So, for example, I will take the ALU behavioral description and then say here is an adder, here is a subtractor, here is a shifter, here is a series of AND gates, here is a series of OR gates and when put together connected like this, then they constitute this ALU, right. In the next step, I will say this adder is this connections of ANDs and ORs, etcetera, etcetera, XORs, correct. So, this whole design process, the journey from here to here is a gradual conversion of behavioral description, fully behavioral description to a fully structural description. Where do we stop? We stop at a point where the components which we are using are already available and it is beneath contempt to design them, okay. Now, that depends on the level of your technology. For example, you might say that below deep flip flop there is no point going. Deep flip flops are easily available, do not ask me to design a deep flip flop, okay. Or you may have to go down to a transistor and say that even the deep flip flop has to be broken down to a transistor. So, that depends on what kind of library is already available to you. You have a library of components and those components are considered atomic. The richer is this library, the less work you have to do in order to design. For example, once you reach an adder, you may stop saying adder is there in my library, right. So, essentially when the components become components of a library, then you need not design any further, right, because then adder is beneath contempt. Do not even talk to me how an adder is to be made. Adder is there in the library, I will pick up that element from the library and place it. It is equivalent to saying that I will go to the market and buy a 7474 and my D flip flop is there right. So, or whatever and beyond that I am I need not design. So, that because 7474 is a equivalent of a library for you. So, essentially what it means is that when I stop, I stop at a fully detailed interconnection of a set of components and these components are considered atomic and are known behaviorally to me and there is no need to go beyond behavioral for that, right. So, essentially I start where the whole circuit is behavioral and end with a circuit which is fully structural of components which are known behaviorally. Is this part clear? This is, this is the journey and therefore, any hardware description language should be able to cope with the behavior of a circuit which is designed in any gradation of mixing of behavioral 
and structural description. Okay? For example, suppose I was to tell a hardware description language that I have a circuit like this and these are the inputs and these are the outputs. And now, if I say that I excite this circuit with such and such waveform, it should be able to tell you that this, this will be the output. All right. On the other hand, the same program, if I tell it that here is a black box whose behavior is described in this fashion, that assign to q the value of d when there is a positive positive edge on clock this is also an acceptable description and this is also an acceptable description now i may have different blocks some of this kind and some of this kind and I may put them all together in an interconnection and now this whole circuit may be excited with a certain input and it should be able to tell me that this will be your output. All right? This is the hallmark of a hardware description language. That means, it should have the capability of any gradation of behavioral and structural description and should be able to simulate it without any problem, if whether it is behavioral or description. Okay? So, this is point number 1, what, what the HDL is supposed to do. The second part is that the HDL actually has to, it, it actually looks very much like a programming language. And most of our students, by the way, how many of you have used hardware description languages? Okay, so, quite a few. All of you will agree that if you look at an HDL, it looks like a programming language. Okay? Therefore, all the more reason that, that it is very important to tell your students that it is anything but, it is not a programming language. Okay? So, why is it not a programming language even though it looks and smells like a programming language? Okay? The reason for that is the following. When you have a programming language, it is a series of steps which are executed sequentially. Okay? So, the software is sequential. On the other hand, hardware is concurrent. Every part of the circuit reacts at the same time. Suppose you apply something, then all parts of it will react at the same time. Right? Therefore, to treat hardware as a program is inherently bad. But on the other hand, this hardware description language is going to run on a computer and therefore, it has to do everything sequentially through a program. So, how do I describe something which is inherently concurrent using a device which is inherently sequential? Okay? This is the purpose of the hardware description language in that sense. It converts a sequential program and uses that program to describe something which is parallel. Okay? So, now let us see how that is done. So, what we say is, listen, if one thing is sequential and the system you are describing is parallel, then you cannot have a proper clock, because then you are simply saying that it will take me some time to describe one step and the next guy, I will actually be describing it later, but it should behave as if it occurred at the same time. right? So, I cannot have a sequential clock in this system. I must have some way of controlling the time. Okay? So, the way to do it is that now we say that the time to compute, the time to run the program is of no consequence whatsoever. That is something else. right? I do not care. What I am going to do is to describe everything and I will have a time variable. So, the time is a variable. Now, I may do 
operation x operation y operation z one after the other but as long as the value of the time variable remains the same these will be considered parallel see you know concurrent and when the time has to be advanced i will do it as a conscious action not as a way of continuous flow of time so i will say all right now everything which was to have happened at this event has now been done and now please advance the clock to the next thing okay so the so the so the advance of time is no more continuous it has been granularized and i do everything which happened at the same instant of time i may do it sequentially that doesn't matter how much time do i take to do it doesn't matter the time variable remains the same value therefore everything which i did would be interpreted as having occurred at one instant and which is the value of time which is at that time set this is the way i can handle concurrency okay you got that all right therefore i must understand time very well unfortunately time is a is a complicated beast it is not as simple as it appears okay i will illustrate this by an example let's say that i have a trivial circuit it does nothing at all it simply delays a signal okay so let's say that i have this black box this is its input this is its output and the function of this block is to delay it by 30 microseconds okay could be 30 nanosecond anything invent some time for this now what's the behavioral description of this the behavioral description of this is assigned to output the value of input after 30 microseconds right this is the behavioral description that whatever happens to the input make it happen at the output but after 30 microseconds right now let's try to implement there are various ways of imp implementing it the idea is was my specification unique was it unambiguous if it was not that it might lead to different implementations which are not equivalent okay if i am ambiguous so let's see is there room for ambiguity here or is it clear enough so let's take the most obvious implementation of this i will have let's say an rc delay and followed by a buffer so that i, I get a nice clean digital signal and the value of this rc has been so adjusted that the total delay including the delay of the uh, buffer is 30 microseconds okay let's consider this scenario right this is this is a reasonable implementation of this i have converted this behavioral description to this structural description of known components okay let's say that the inverter uh, the buffer is a known component resistor capacitor these are all known components let's produce a test case for this now in this test case what i do is suppose i apply to this delay circuit a pulse train which has one pulse which is much narrower than the delay and another pulse which is much wider than the delay okay and let's apply this input to this implementation all right now this is not what the uh, hdl will actually calculate but we know in reality what will happen so as this input goes high at this particular point this capacitor starts charging but it has hardly charged up to any value when it comes down and it starts discharging right so as a result the input to this inverter looks like it starts charging but immediately starts discharging right and at a later time starts charging but charges all the way up and then discharges for the wider this is what happens at this hidden node x and what does the buffer do it acts as a discriminator it says all voltages below some voltage is zero 
all voltages above that voltage is 1, right. So, essentially what it does is that it converts this to this waveform, right. So, I get a delayed version of the input except that this narrow pulse has vanished. The wider pulse is delayed as specified, but the narrow pulse has vanished. This kind of delay is called inertial delay. But somebody else might look at this description and say this is not how I will delay the input signal. What I am going to do is I am going to put an LED at the input with some current limiter or whatever and then couple this light to an optical fiber which is long enough to produce 30 microseconds of delay and then put a detector here which will convert it to a digital waveform and put that at the output. This is also one way of delaying the input by 30 microseconds. I have carefully calculated the length of the wire required to produce the amount of delay that I want, okay. Now, let us apply the same test pulse to this one. What will happen at the output? Both the pulses will arrive, right. The narrow pulse will not vanish. So, now the behavior in the two cases is qualitatively different even though both are implementations of the same intended behavior, the actual behavior of the uh, synthesized circuit is qualitatively different. Why did this happen? Because it turned out that we had not realized that there are two kinds of delay and I must not specify only the delay, I must specify what kind of delay I mean, okay. Obviously, this kind of delay is not illegal the RC kind of delay, in fact that is the most common kind of delay, nor is this kind of delay illegal, okay. However, the output behavior can be vastly different and therefore, if I have to specify the, uh, the circuit properly, otherwise my specification itself is non-unique, okay, is not clear enough. So, therefore, I must specify the circuit also specifying what kind of delay I need, okay. This kind of delay is called a transport delay. All right. So, therefore, now we have a better understanding of time. In general, however, this kind of delay is not very common in circuits. The circuit delays are typically RC kind of delays. Therefore, the default kind of delay is inertia. So, in most hardware description languages, if you do not specify what kind of delay it is, it will be taken to be inertial. If you want a transport delay, then you must be, you must specify the keyword transport, okay. Then the delay will be taken to be of the transport type. There is one exception to it. The input specification to any circuit is always supposed to be a transport kind of delay, right. For example, if I was to describe this waveform itself, right. So, I will say that make the input 0 at t equal to 0, make it 1 at t equal to 10 make it 0 at t equal to 15, remain 0 till t equal to 50, make it 1 at t equal to 50 and make it 0 at 150. Now, this is an input specification, description of this waveform. If this input itself became uh, inertial, then obviously, I will never be able to apply this input. The input itself, this particular thing will vanish, right. So, therefore, the delays specified at the input specification are by default transport. All other delays, if unless specified, are taken to be inertial, okay. If you specify transport, of course, it will be taken as a transport delay. Otherwise, they are taken to be inertial delay, 
okay only the input specifications waveform specifications or any waveform specification is considered to be transport that means essentially it is truly reproduced to be applied to the circuit uh, where you want to apply the input all right this part is clear okay so when time when it is a question of time there are two things which need to be specified the amount of delay and the type of delay the type of delay is inertial by default and the amount of delay is zero by default if you don't specify a delay then it is supposed to be zero units of time and of inertial kind all right this is the default value but that immediately brings a problem to our head because nothing happens in zero time in hardware anything which occurs must occur in non zero time but here is this guy telling us that this thing should happen in zero time okay so the this may lead to problems because there may be two signals which arrive very close in time and the output may depend on which one arrived first and which one arrived later indeed it could be the here so whether the set arrived first or the reset arrived first will depend decide whether this q is 1 and this is 0 or that is 0 this is 1 right so therefore the order the time order that means the sequence of inputs is of great importance therefore we should not describe destroy that sequence and the way this is done is that internally a hardware description language invents something called a delta delay and delta is some undefined number which is a very small amount of delay but the simulator keeps track that this happened at t this happened at t plus delta this happened at t plus 2 delta this happened at t plus m delta right and this happened at t plus 2 microsecond now when the final results are presented and only when the final results are presented to the user you take the limit of delta going to zero so for example something might have occurred at 30 microseconds something else might have occurred at 30 microseconds plus delta something else would have occurred at 30 microseconds plus 2 delta and so on now for internal use you will always keep track that this occurred earlier than that is important for the behavior of the circuit but when you present the final result you will take the limit delta equal to 0 and to the outside world you will say this as well as this as well as this occurred at 30 micro okay so this is the mystery of the delta delay in hardware description languages essentially to keep the scheduling proper things are calculated to the accuracy of some arbitrary parameter called delta so you actually keep it's a two component thing a real time plus the number of deltas okay so the time is kept track kept track of in a, as a two component system the real time plus this many deltas okay and the time ordering is important because the deltas are important in time ordering whenever you order something in time then the deltas are taken into account but when the results are reported all deltas are put to zero and it is reported as if it occurred at that time is this part clear the delta time right so because it is important the sequence is important for the behavior of circuits you keep this artificial delta time uh, internally and eventually take the limit as delta goes to zero if you have specified zero time right if you have specified a real time then of course the delay will be that much time sir you are saying that uh, when outputs are reported delta is assumed to be zero it means accuracy is kept hidden when outputs are reported no 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 accuracy is not you specified as zero time you otherwise delta would no, never have come so some input sequence is coming one pulse comes at t and another comes at t plus delta no no there is you you don't know anything about delta you have said that this process takes zero time then the uh, the program has a little laugh while you are not watching and he says what you really mean is that this occurred at t and this occurred at t plus delta 
So, the problem started with you because you did not specify the amount of delta and most of the time our first simulation we, we do not give any time, but internally it says that a result and the cause must be separated in time and the result must always be a delta delayed compared to the input, but that because you have you claim that this, this guy took 0 time. Therefore, internally it will maintain accounts of deltas, but when it reports back to you because you said it takes 0 time, it will put the value of delta equal to 0. So, there is no loss of resolution. If you want that okay, this inverter takes 30 picoseconds of delay and the output equal to input bar after 30 picoseconds, then it will properly produce. It will use 30 picoseconds in that case, but if you did not specify the time, it will internally use the delta. Delay. No, delta delay is an artificially, it is, it, it does not exist except for ordering things in time, because later we will see time ordering is very important. So, the value of delta is actually 0 in the limit, but you do not lose that resolution internally, because it is often very important as to say which happened first and which happened later. In software it would not have mattered, but this is very important in hardware because essentially you are artificially creating a parallel process from a sequential simulation, right. So, you have to keep track of what happened when. So, you say this happened at this time and this happened at this time plus delta and this happened at this time plus delta. In reality, that delta may be put to 0 eventually and if there is a finite amount of time that you have specified, then you will say that this happened at 30, this happened at 31, this happened at 35 and so on. All right. If you say 0, then it does not believe you, it does not take 0. It says that the effect should always be delayed by a delta from the cause okay. and if that causes another phenomenon, then that will be one delta after this and so on. So, the whole chain will be triggered and kept track of. Then you have a list of things which occurred at t, t plus delta, t plus 2 delta, t plus 3 delta and they will all be time ordered in that way and your simulation will complete and when the results are given to you back, then the value of delta will be put to 0. Okay? So, this is how we handle parallelism using this delta delay and advancing the time in a specific fashion. Now, this is we, with this we have done absolutely the basic underlying assumptions about hardware description. Now comes the time for seeing what really happens during simulation and this is extremely important to understand because things are specified as if it is a computer program, but what happens internally is extremely different okay? and this leads to all sorts of problems with inexperienced designers. So, we next come to the idea of a transaction and an event. Yeah. Sir, uh, can, you, can you say that the uh, simulation delay, uh, the internal delay has not been specified by the user? Internal? Delay has not been specified, means zero delay is there and if the realization of the circuit which is a feedback type of circuit. So, under that condition how the simulation is? Exactly. So, you will require for that. Consider the following. Let us say that you say out equals A or B, okay. In VHDL for example, you will use a syntax like this. Now, you have not specified any time. So, what VHDL will do is whenever the value of A or B changes, it will recalculate the value of out, but the new value will be assigned not at the same time when A or B change, but a delta time after that. Okay? So, that later suppose you were to suppose now there is a different circuit which uses A and out and let us say B has not changed at all. Okay? So, let us say B has been at 0 throughout. Now, at this point A changed, the output B is 0. So, the output will, will change 
at a time which is delta later. Okay? This delta will be zapped to 0 when the output is, is reported. So, then it will look like that, you will get the proper waveform there. However, now there is this circuit and this circuit will be woken up twice, once to say A has changed, what is your output? At this point the out has not yet changed, okay? so its output will be scheduled to become something because of this change in A. Then a delta time later it will be woken up again saying out has changed, what is your output? And correspondingly the output will be rescheduled for some time plus 2 delta. Okay? So, the fact that A and out are not simultaneous and A arrives before out is retained in the simulator. If you had put this delay equal to 0, then this order would have been lost. So, for all you know, the circuit inside here is that old latch. Now, whether A came first or out came first is significant. Accordingly, the output would be set or reset. And even though they came delta first or delta later, the final output will be determined by that. And therefore, this order is important. Finally, the output will be presented with delta equal to put, put equal to 0. But how to determine whether this output is 1 or 0 requires whether A came first or out came first. Okay? Where uh, again a dot uh, a with some function out is there, that output is connected to third level of the circuit. So, so, then so we have to add the two deltas, and after that only it is. That's going right. To so you, yeah. it's a two-dimensional time. One is the real time, and the other is how many deltas. Okay, and you keep track of both of them throughout. All right. Only when you go to the next real time, the delta will be set to zero. So, for example, suppose the next clock arrived at 30 microseconds. This happened at 20 microseconds. So, you kept track of 20, 20 plus delta, 20 plus 2 delta, 20 plus 3 delta, 20 plus 4 delta, and then 30, and then 30 plus delta, 30 plus 2 delta, 30 plus 3 delta, and so on. Okay? And then finally, when the results are produced, then you will see only 20 and 30. But the results will be correct in the time order, and they would not have been correct unless you put this fine distinction of what happened at 20 and what happened at 20 plus delta. In, in everything you, you take delta, if you say 0, the simulator humors you saying okay, you really do not mean 0, you are simply saying that I do not care, it is some infinitesimally small time, 0 is impossible. Okay? So, it humors you and internally uses delta instead and later because you said so, it puts the value of delta equal to 0. So, it is not just for counters, for every Whenever you say time is 0, it replaces that 0 by a delta. On the other hand, if you do not, for example, you might de define the OR gate as something whose output is A or B after 10 microseconds, then it is happy. It will schedule the output after 10 microseconds. Okay? All right. So, the next thing to understand about hardware description languages is, I am running <laughs> terribly short of time myself, of inertial time. So, uh, the next thing to be, uh, uh, to be understood is, is, is this idea of transaction. So, essentially you have an assignment which is of this kind, where the right hand side is some expression. It could be logic, it could be anything, it could be if, then, else, whatever, some expression. Then the way it is handled in hardware description languages is the following. When you struck this statement, then the all the variables on the right hand side at that instant had some value. Okay? The entire right hand side is evaluated at that time, but the output is not put in this variable immediately. It is put in a waiting storage 
and it is scheduled to be assigned to this at some future time. If you have specified a delay, then that future time is the current time plus delay. If you have not specified that time, then that time is the current time plus delta. But in any, in any case, the assignment is never made immediately if, if it is not a variable. For variables, it is like a computer programming, but for a signal, the assignment is not made immediately ever. It is scheduled to be assigned and that scheduling takes actual effect at a time determined by the amount of delay. And if zero delay is specified, then the actual value is acquired at t plus delta. This thing is often not understood by students and you very often have bugs like, like this. So, you say assign sum to command and if command equal to sum c equals a plus b else c equals a minus b. Okay? You will very often find code like this. Now, this will do all sorts of terrible things and if you go through this code a hundred times, you will never, if you think that it is a computer program, you will never, th never find out what is wrong with this. So, what is wrong with this? All right. When you say assign sum to command, it has scheduled the value sum to command, but the actual value is not sum. The actual value is the old value. Therefore, when the if is executed, sum has the old value. Okay? So, it is not necessary that it is a, the uh, command has the old value, because the assignment has not been done. The time is still t. It will become equal to sum at t plus delta, but the current time is only t. We have not yet advanced the time. All of this is happening at the same time. So, therefore, the value of command is not sum. Right? Therefore, this equality will be sometimes true if the old value was also sum and sometimes false if the old value was subtract. Okay? So, therefore, what this if will do is according to the old value of command, not according to the new value of command. Okay? So, if Murphy is alive and well, then it will so happen that the old value of command will also be sum and then you will go, you know, hurrah my uh, circuit works and then you will call, go and call the instructor by that time the program has been running and the old value is minus and every time you do instead of adding a plus uh, giving you the value a plus b it start giving you the value a minus b okay and this is because you have treated it like a computer program any computer programmer will will draw that value from it but this is not a program this is a hardware description okay so therefore never read it as assigned to command the value sum. Always read it as schedule for command the value of sum, because this assignment is going to take place in the future, not right now. Okay? And in the, at the current time, it retains its old value. Right? And this also illustrates the value of delta. What will happen is that if you had weighted a delta here, then this if would have been correct, because you have given time for this output to settle to its value. But if you have not given time to settle to its value, this is not correct. Okay? Now, this is extremely, extremely important because consider a trivial case of a shift register. Consider this shift register. What is the behavior? Behavior is that add pausage of clock do the following. Assign to Q0 the value of D, assign to Q1 the value of Q0 and assign to Q2 the value of Q1. Right? This is the description of that 
all to take place only when the clock has a pausage. Okay? Now, suppose you did not have this, suppose you assigned the values right then without a delta time later. What will happen? The value of d will be assigned to q0 immediately and that same value because q0 is equal to d will be assigned to q1 and that same value will be assigned to q2. So, this is not a shift register at all, it is a dead shot. Everybody q0, q1 and q2 have got the value d. This is the circuit you are describing. Right? And this is not what you intended. Though the description appears to describe what you wanted that at pausage of clock do this, in fact you have ended up with something totally nonsensical. Right? On the other hand, if the assignment is done at delta time later, then all is all is fine. Because now what happens? You are saying make q0 the value of d in the next delta. Now, q0 has its old value. Then you are saying that make q1 equal to q0 in the next delta. Therefore, q1 also retains its old value and so on down the line. And when the next delta comes, only then these things acquire their values and therefore, the shift register works properly. Okay? So, this tells you how important that delta time is. Otherwise, you will get completely nonsensical results. All right? So, therefore, it is very this, this sequencing is very, very important. Without it, you will not be able to describe hardware properly. Okay?